Good evening, everybody um, who's already joined us. Um, we've just got a few more minutes until um, seven o'clock, um, so we'll get started shortly. Um, so we're going to get started. Good, e good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for the webinar this evening, where we'll be discussing, discussing future opportunities to achieve sustainable medicine use in the UK. Uh, my name is Grace Whitlow and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Manager for our Beef and Lamb team. And tonight we'll be hearing from Nuffield Farming Scholars, uh, Duncan Williams and Grace O'Gorman. Uh, Grace will be speaking first, and she's a senior, senior Technical Policy Manager at the National Office of Animal Health based in London. Her work includes the management of the Animal Medicine's Best Practice Training Programme for Farmers on the responsible use of antibiotics alongside work on animal health policy, regulation and future trade. Grace grew up on a beef farm in Ireland and trained as a veterinary scientist and veterinary surgeon, completing her studies in Dublin. She was a lecturer in animal health at Hartbury College and is a 2019 Nuffield Farming Scholar. Um, Duncan has graduated from the RVC in 2011 and has worked as a dairy vet and consultant in the UK, the USA, New Zealand and China. His work focuses on implementing antibiotic reduction programmes throughout the dairy supply chain. He is currently studying a Master's in Sustainable Development at the University of Exeter. Um, so the plan of action for this evening is that Grace and Duncan will take us through their presentations, which will collectively last around 35 minutes. Um, following this, there will be time for questions at the end. If you do think of a question, you can type it into the question box at any time, which usually sits on the right hand side of your screen. If you can't see this box, you may need to click on the little orange arrow to open up the box, then click on the questions drop down uh, and you'll see where you can type your question in. Um, I do encourage you to type your question is in as they come up in your head and we'll address them at the end. Um, and as usual, you'll all be muted throughout this webinar. So please use this box to let us know if you are having any technical problem uh, and we'll do our best to help. Um, unless it's something on our end, the usual advice is just log out and log back in. So um, to kick us off, um, I'm going to start. Um, the webinar with by introducing a poll uh, which we'd really appreciate if you could take part in okay so 
So um, let me know what you think of the poll and we'll get on to listening to Grace on her, her presentation. I'll just give it another 20 seconds. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, and as you can see, these are the results for the poll. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Grace, who can discuss the poll results and go through um, her presentation with you all. Grace, uh, you can you hear me? Yeah, I can indeed. How's that? Yes, perfect. That's great. Can, um, can you see the poll at the moment? Or I I can't, but I quickly just took scribble down um, the few notes. So thank you very much, um, Grace. That's actually really interesting. Um, and not probably terribly surprising that people are put at the center of what's really important in terms of driving um, animal medicine specs practice. So really interesting um, to see that result coming through. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thank you all for joining me here um, this evening and Duncan and hope you in, enjoy the next um, couple of talks. Uh, we're both 2019 Nuffield Scholars. So today I want to give you a flavor of that scholarship journey um, and the actual um, study that I went on, which was Animal Medicine's Best Practice. Um, not only do I have to thank AHDB for the invite um, in terms of joining you here today, but they're actually my sponsor as well. So a huge um, thanks to them for making this opportunity possible. And in particular to Clive Brown, Mandy Neville and Derek Armstrong um, for their support right throughout the process. Um, so, great. So, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We um, can't see your screen, your slides at the moment. Okay. Um, I think if you go on to sharing, um, where it says show screen, that should, um, come on. oh, now there I see you. Go. Yep, there we go. How's okay. that one? That's great, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Brilliant. Okay, well, you didn't miss anything. That was just the title slide, so that's perfect. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll crack on with the presentation. So to give you um, a backdrop and an inspiration to my study, it's really looking at livestock farming and where the ambition is um, for the future. We know all about the challenges that are out there, but hopefully you will agree that we're looking for a healthy future that's resilient and sustainable. And we're hearing more and more often about the need to be um, productive and profitable. And of course, it makes sense in business to be profitable. But perhaps when we think about things like productivity, we should be thinking not about producing more and more, but looking at how we can drive down losses, reducing mortality and morbidity on farms. Increasingly as well, we've got other demands in the supply chain, particularly around transparency. So consumers want to know more about our animal health and welfare standards and what medicines are used on farm and why they are used. And this is going to have real implications for trade, not only at home, but also abroad. And you'll all be aware, I'm sure, of the fact that now and into the future, farming will be supported by the public purse in the UK. So we have this phrase, public money for public goods. And that really sets in motion um, 
a situation where people will want to know and understand a little bit more about the standards in which their food is produced. So what do we need to do? We need to position ourselves to be able to um, recognize, apply and demonstrate best practice. So how do we do that? Well, that's kind of the central core tenant of my study. And I wanted to identify some of these factors that support best practice. And some of them you'll have seen there in the poll Ray, right at the start. Sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. I'm just um, looking at your slides. Uh, it appears a little bit of it's being cut off on the right hand side. Um, okay. I'm not sure whether on the sharing on the show screen, we can adjust, adjust the, the view there. Maybe using that one, does that help? That's perfect. Yeah, oh, see. lovely. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah. So it's just a title, a uh, second slide here, just to show you that I'm really interested in the factors that support animal medicine's best practice and really looking at the strategies and where we can unlock some opportunity. And I also want to look at animal medicines as well and what the future holds um, for animal medicines in the UK. So where did the Nuffield journey take me? Well, back in 2019, which seems like a long time ago now, I went on a tour to various countries in Europe and that kind of split into two regions. One was those high production countries that have some of the similar challenges that we have here in the UK, but perhaps have had a different response to them in, in terms of how they tackle them. But also I wanted to go to some of those lower production Scandinavian countries that actually um, are well known for having a prevention is better than cure approach. I decided as well that it would be really good to visit New Zealand and I completed that journey um, between February and March last year, just getting back before um, lockdown in the UK. And there was two elements to this trip. There was one where I wanted to understand how New Zealand, who's well known in terms of competing um, on the export market with good quality produce, how they were doing that, but at the same time balancing um, responsible use of antibiotics, anthelmintic resistance and animal welfare issues. And I also wanted to look at perhaps future collaborative partners, looking at where the UK and other countries could collaborate in terms of licensing veterinary medicines. And I thought New Zealand would be a natural partner to have a look um, at that as well. So I would say one of the first things that came to mind um, looking um, at all of the people and places that I visited is that no one country got everything absolutely perfectly right. But if you look across the piece collectively, they started to illustrate together what you could actually achieve. And a key take home for me was that where people focused on animal health and welfare, animal medicine's best practice naturally followed suit. But within that, there was probably four key themes that kept coming out time and again as being really important influencing factors in improving how medicines are used. And one of these was animal health partnerships or involvement in various animal health programs. The second was the people, and this came out in the poll, really important. It's the vets and the farmers working together, the animal health team, to make it actually happen. Um, data and how to make good use of it um, was something that came up time and again. And finally, effective biosecurity on farm. So if I just give you one example of each of these, and you can um, look at it in more detail in my Nuffield report if you want to see other examples. The first one looking at animal health partnerships. So a closest neighbor, Ireland, looking at Animal Health Ireland, a program you might be familiar with. And they've been working on endemic disease over the last 10 years, particularly in the ruminant sector. And it's been quite successful in terms of tackling endemic disease. And when I spoke to their chief executive, I wanted to understand what were the elements of establishing a program like that, that would really make it successful. And it was clear that right from the outside, they had a vision that everybody could sign up to, was indisputable. They had good, strong industry leadership and stakeholder buy-in right from the very beginning. But one of their strongest um, points and their strongest contributions was the ability to coordinate lots of groups together. And so they've done that quite well. And in addition to reducing endemic disease, one of the bystander effects from it that I witnessed was driving animal medicine's best practice. And that's through the establishment of various programs like controlling BVD and also in responsible use of antibiotics. 
But of course, it's important when you have these developments to actually be able to um, roll them out at scale and having effective partnerships, looking at rural extension services is a really good way um, to actually get to change at pace. And so they do have a memorandum of understanding with the state agency Chagask and they work hand in glove together in terms of common principles to get to where they need to go. So that was a good example. So I talked about people and really important here are the vets and the farmers. And just looking at some of the dairy farms I visited in Northern um, Germany, one of the key things that came out in terms of the successful ones, these are the ones that knew they needed to be resilient. They needed to get ahead of everybody else. And so their attention to detail, looking at things very, very closely, their protocols, um, really dealing with issues before they got out of hand was something that came up time and again. Speaking with the veterinary profession in New Zealand, they were undergoing a lot of um, consultation and change when it came to how they use their medicines. And in particular, they were interested in veterinary oversight through the whole medicine life cycle. So from prescribing to use to disposal on farm, and they're doing a lot of work in that area. One of the key ways in which I saw vets operating quite differently in the UK and compared to other countries was in visiting places like Belgium and the Netherlands where vets out on farm were doing a whole host of other activities in addition to your normal veterinary services um, just simple things like being really involved in vaccination protocols um, and farmers seem to really value that input but also looking at an example here the Goderis cow company in Belgium really involved in looking at the broader peace and farm so looking at things like ventilation and housing and speaking to those farmers, they really um, view these vets as trusted advisors. And that partnership was really, really valued. So you can see when this works together and works quite well, it can really help drive um, best practice on farm and it's really important. So the effective use of data and how we gather the right data and only gather what we need and how we make it useful is just came up time and time again. I think it's something that every country really struggles with and it's something that we're really developing here in the UK um, at pace now and HDB has had a major role um, with this with the medicines hub. So I had an opportunity to visit um, the veterinary institute in Sweden and speak to um, a veterinary epidemiologist Fernanda Doria and she was developing the model here and just gives you an overview of how to capture data and make it useful for farmers and vets, so at a very local level, but also at the state level as well. And she was sensitive to the fact that people don't necessarily want to share their data or are a bit worried about sharing their data. So she was looking at ways in which you can analyze data at source, almost on farm, and then only share what you need to share, the kind of summary statistics um, and indicators at the national level. And she's hoping to gather data from a whole range of sources and to combine that to give it a nice feedback loop and helping vets to make better decisions. So by vets contributing to this information, getting information back, it's a kind of a positive feedback loop. And so it's probably worth thinking as we're designing these various um, traceability um, data capture systems in the UK, it's worth thinking about future proofing them and where they need to evolve to, where they need to go and how we can offer value for farmers and vets at the local level, but also leverage it for trade opportunity at the national level as well. So biosecurity is probably one of those topics that people feel quite fatigued about. They don't really get too excited about it and it's hard to get people engaged with this topic. Um, from looking at my travels in Europe, I think one thing that came out quite strongly was that you need to um, develop new social norms and you need to make it specific to that farm. So just a, one simple example was with vets in the Netherlands. They never brought any of their gear with them um, out um, on the farm visits. Everything was at the farm. And it was a, as you crossed over the, um, the, the threshold and you changed into the farm gear, it was kind of a visual reminder as well of the importance of biosecurity. A passage through there that reminded everybody of the need to ensure that you um, keep up good biosecurity. Um, and speaking then with um, the University of Ghent, they developed this evaluation and assessment tool, BioCheck. And this was initially in the poultry and pig industry, but it's now available um, for cattle. And it's a nice tool where you can look at what the risks are on your farm 
And I think there's a real role here for vets to actually get involved in not only going through that um, tool and that assessment, but also in helping farmers implement the changes that they could um, affect that are specific to their farm. So getting away from some of the generic biosecurity advice and making it more meaningful to them as well. And it probably goes without saying that if you've got better biosecurity, you've got better control on disease, either introduction onto farm or within the farm, then you are going to have more precision medicine. You're going to be um, using medicines more rationally, um, which is best practice. So all of these key influencing factors that I've mentioned could be applied to any medicine category, but I want to focus on um, four areas in particular, just briefly in terms of some of the key thoughts I had about them. So Duncan will go on and talk about this um, in a good bit more detail about his view on antibiotics and sustainable use and, and his views on the UK. And I'm only going to touch on it here, but suffice to say, we've made a lot of progress um, in the last number of years. And a lot of that has been driven by a completely voluntary approach. We do have the veterinary medicines regulations, but there's been a lot of voluntary initiative there. As we go into this next phase and looking at long-term sustainable use, we're probably going to have to think about other tricks in the book um, to actually affect um, sustainable use right through the supply chain. And that may involve some regulatory actions. We can think about the importance of benchmarking, whether that's at farm level or for vets, in terms of um, reaching those um, hard to reach um, practices and, and making sure that we get widespread sustainable use. I think it's worth thinking about concepts such as establishing one-to-one -one vet farmer relationships, um, training and having participatory approaches on farm, I think would be really important as well. We can certainly make more use of data. We've just talked about that. And particularly when we think about antibiotics, treatment outcome data, knowing what actually works and what didn't work and feeding that back in could be quite useful. But at the end of the day, it has to make sense in terms of farming businesses and also for trade opportunity in terms of leveraging our progress. So vaccination, incredibly topical at the moment. Um, and if we look at vaccination in terms of the livestock sector, there's definitely potential there in terms of um, ruminants in particular whether that is looking at currently quite variable picture in terms of uptake or maybe um, applying it a little bit better in terms of storage and use on farm. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of the vets in Europe are much more involved in vaccination. That's just the way their system is set up. And it made me think about how we could perhaps help farmers in the UK a little bit more to get more from their investment um, on farm. And I think if we look at some of the um, future proposals in terms of government support, we could embed things like vaccination protocols a lot more proactively and reviews of those in farm health planning. And so it's probably important just to say that if you want to get the most out of vaccination, it's, you know, it's not something that stands up on its own. It's not going to um, replace good management practices. And in fact, good management around it will enable farmers to get the very most from their vaccination. And so the next um, topic I wanted to quickly look at was parasite control. And this is what I think is probably one of the most difficult ones to get really right, because every farm is a little bit different. So you can have best practice and you, you sh and you can know what good principles are, but to convert that into good sound advice that's specific to the farm can be quite tricky. This is one example of, of um, a place I visited. It's the farm of Mike and Liz McGreary, and they finished 30,000 lambs um, on their farm in the North, North Island. And so they have a high density of quite young animals on that farm. And as you can imagine, um, drench resistance quickly became a problem. But they got involved in a project to tackle this. And what was really interesting is that they took this landscape level approach is what they called it, where they worked with the breeders, them as finishers and the processors to pull together and to see how one action in one side of the business could affect um, the resistance patterns and what happened on the other side of the business. And so they really understood that it wasn't just about switching around drenches. And actually, when they started speaking about farming worms as well as sheep, you got this idea that they were beginning to really get to grips with the fact that this was tricky and difficult and required a lot of work to get at. Um, but they were willing to, um, to make that work. And then the final category is pain management. And I would say this is one of the areas where 
every single country I visited was at a different stage in the process towards making improvements in, in providing pain management on farm. But they were doing it for different reasons. So, for example, in Norway, it was very much linked to animal welfare. In places like Denmark, it was much more linked to driving productivity. And in the Netherlands, more closely associated with responsible use of antibiotics. And we frequently, more and more, you hear it in Parliament, we talk about having the highest welfare standards in the world here in the UK. And I think if we're to say that and to stand up with that, then we need to be careful and ensure that we are actually providing a really um, good standard best practice in terms of pain relief on farm. And finally, just look into the future of veterinary medicine. So outside the EU, the UK is a market is a smaller market, and it's actually a little bit smaller than that again, because there's a GB now and a Northern Ireland market. So you've got to start thinking of ways in which you continue to make it attractive in the medium to long term for products to be launched and available in this country. And one of the ways you can do that is think about international collaboration. So I spoke to um, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate in the UK and also the equivalent in New Zealand. And it was really great to hear that actually they are a ways down a conversation about how they can collaboratively work together to begin lice collaboratively licensing medicines, which is really good to see. And I think if we look at this process of international collaboration and taking a science based approach, then you can begin to see how actually the UK can continue to be quite a good place to um, launch medicines into the future. But again, thinking about how that reflects on trade policy, it's something that we have to continue to, um, to embed into that thinking. It has to support trade policy going forward. So that's a whistle stop tour of my um, Nuffield presentation. My take home messages are that if you really want to drive animal medicine's best practice, focus on animal health and welfare. To do that in the UK, we need a strategy and a vision that spans the four nations. We need to recognize, apply and demonstrate best practice to really um, drive resilience in the sector, a healthy sector going forward. And I spoke about various different positive influencing factors, and it's all about building them into an animal health ecosystem, building the future of animal health in the UK that's more resilient. And when it comes to having products available for farmers and vets into the future, it's all about international collaboration and taking a science-based approach. And then it just leaves me to say thank you to the rest of my 2019 Nuffield cohort and to AHDB. It would not have been possible without them. And I suppose the final thing is just to plug um, Nuffield in terms of if you're anybody is listening in and they're interested in doing a scholarship themselves, I'd highly recommend it. You give you a flavour of the countries I visited and the people I met. Um, there's um, applications every year until I think it is about July. You just have to be under 45 years of age. Um, and if you're interested in doing that, just give us a shout and happy to have a chat to anybody. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grace. That was really interesting. And I don't know about anyone else, but I think um, it's definitely made me tempted to take up an Uffield Farming Scholarship. Um, so now we're going to listen to Duncan, uh, who's also an Uffield Scholar. Um, I'm just going to share, let him present his presentation. No worries. Sorry, we, uh, that's it. Okay, yeah, we can see you. Uh, we can see your slides. So, yeah, far away. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And um, yeah, really great to to hear Grace talking about the stuff that she discovered on her travels. I definitely echo her in saying it's an absolutely fantastic experience to do. I'd really recommend it. Uh, even just sort of going through the process about thinking what the big question that you want to to answer um, at the stage of career that you're in is just a fantastic a sort of a mental exercise to go through even just in the um, even in, in the application uh, process. So my my sponsors my Nuffield uh, scholarship were the Dartington Cattle Breeders Trust and the Richard Laws Foundation so very grateful uh, to them and to the entire Nuffield team for, for making it all happen. Um, like, like Grace I finished my travels slightly curtailed um, actually because of the COVID pandemic but sort of in March this time last year I was uh, flying back from India um, having just sort of this sort of whistle-stop tour around 
uh, northern Indians agricultural sector and it was absolutely fascinating and really that kind of experience uh, is very hard to to emulate in any other kind of study uh, so yeah very much uh, recommend it now so I'm going to talk about antibiotics achieving sustainable use this is really uh, something that's probably filled my my working life for the last five years um, even before before the Nuffield I, I am uh, dairy by by training and by practice um, but I think a lot of the learnings that we can take from the antibiotic question do cr cut across um, both both between dairy and beef and sheep um, but then also into into wider agriculture as well so I do want to promise you that the antibiotic issue is is an absolutely fascinating one I think it's, it's just about the most fascinating one out there because it sits like right at the heart of, of human and animal health um, it really intertwines into all of our economic questions our ethical questions justice um, and then also asks questions around you know who are we as an industry what do we want to achieve um, and and then there's this other issue that I think it can really act as a blueprint for a lot of the other issues of sustainable resource use and those are a lot of the questions that agriculture are being asked to, to meet right now. And I really think we've got to look at how we as an industry are able to respond and us as a profession, then a profession are able to respond to some of these challenges that are coming up. So antibiotic resistance, it's got this fascinating uh, overlap of influences. We've got animal welfare, farm economics, medical profession, governments, public, you know, they're all pushing and pulling on what they want this final result to look like. I don't, you know, I don't think that we actually know exactly what drives farm level antibiotic resistance. At, at a national level, we have seen antibiotic use come down and that resistance has come down as well. The science isn't perfect. It's never, it never will be. And I don't think playing sort of blame games between veterinary and medical professions is very, is very helpful. We're never going to get the full epidemiological sort of chain process from a jab and a cow on this field led to this antibiotic resistance infection in a hospital. It's just not going to work like that. But I think it, even if there is a, a, a remote chance that agricultural uh, use can drive human resistance, which there definitely is because they've, they've drawn that link pretty strongly, then I think we've got to be looking at, at all we can do to try and mitigate this. So uh, on my travels, I visited uh, Limerick, and the Western brand group over there, which are the, the largest uh, the chicken uh, producer in, in Ireland. And they had done an incredible job working on their supply chain, looking at the quality of animals they brought into their flock, the environment in which they were kept, and, and, and the nutrition that they were fed. And there's huge differences between poultry and ruminant, obviously, but there are definitely lessons that we can transfer directly across. Individual farmers and, and us as vets can work on all these issues, really seize the opportunity of new technologies and findings that, that, can, that can make this happen. After, after Ireland, I went across to the, to the Netherlands, um, and I would say that they're probably about five years ahead of us um, where, where, where we are right now in terms of, oops, sorry, um, in terms of antibiotics. Um, they've created this, this, this countrywide benchmarking uh, system for farmers and vets and have really taken this rapid unified action which has allowed them to understand where they are and target high uses much, uh, much earlier on in the process. You know, we're finally creating this national benchmarking scheme, it's driven by HDB, it's absolutely fantastic and I really think uh, every farmer, processor, vet needs to get on board with this as soon as possible, put this issue to bed. Um, Right now, we've probably got this case where half of all antibiotics are used by just about a quarter of farmers. And we need to go and figure out exactly what's going on there. It's, it's going to be really different on every single farm. Some will have a disease that they're struggling with. Uh, others are using uh, drugs as you know a bit of a safety blanket. We need, we need to be able to provide bespoke assistance to those individual high users. And that's going to help re reduce that ca cattle use down. Um, it's a really good opportunity for our supply chains to come together, really integrate ourselves and vets to sit there right in the center of all of that, helping drive that change. I, th I think it's part of what we need is, is a bit of a wider shift towards transparency within the supply chain. I think that this notion of, of holding information onto farm or, or within a veterinary surgery um, to try and preserve its value as some sort of you know, um, intellectual property is absolute, it's absolute nonsense. You know, the, the researchers, they talk about information asymmetry. 
where we've got barriers that stop people knowing what's really happening. And it's, it's, it's this lack of transparency that I think helps uh, devalue both meat and milk. It helps commoditize it. It prevents us from showing the good things that we do. And it means that um, product from good and bad farms is mixed together. It's not differentiated in any way. It, the, the high quality farms should be setting the benchmark against which other farms are judged. And I think this is probably how we capture better better value of the products that, that we're being produced and that then with that, the services that we offer as, as a profession. I spent a lot of time over in America and it's got some absolutely great farms, really impressive extension service out there. But the, you know, the more time I spent out there, the more I began to hear these stories of huge environmental and personal costs of doing of doing business out there. You know, they're supposed to be this free market system, but it's really led to just poor coordination of environmental policies, financial models skewed towards bigger, lower margin businesses. Researchers in universities that I spoke to were absolutely despairing that the science, the brilliant science that they were creating, never stood a chance of being put into policies. And you know, there's stories of cattle being kept on antibiotics their entire life because the margins within those industries were so tight that producers couldn't afford not to. So, you know, I traveled around the country and I met a lot of farmers who were paying the price for this. And I think there's this story that we tell ourselves within a lot of agriculture that tightening margins forces inefficient farmers out of business, that there's this you know, this rising tide of productivity that allows good farmers to float and forces poor one to sink. But, you know, I think it places so much faith in, in market mechanisms and we don't have an economic system that takes into account environmental damage. This, this, this concept of negative externalities, which I think we're talking more about now, we need to be talking more about, um, is where the market doesn't include emissions or pollutions. Antibiotic use works really in the same way. Drugs are cheap and very effective. I think that's something when we talk about antibiotics that we don't actually kind of shout, well, we don't want to shout about it, but we don't talk about enough that actually there's a massive financial incentive for the continual use of these, of these drugs. Um, the, the science shows us also that in response to tightening margins, farmers will look to decrease their risk. So they increase antibiotic use. They, they treat animals just in case because the financial consequences of, of an animal dying are just too high versus the cost of a jab. So it was a really important realization to me that, that some of the mechanisms that we actually use and we rely on to drive down antibiotic use might actually be doing completely the, the opposite. So milk churns, they really represent a completely different way of dairy farming. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I've always been dairy focused, but you know that there's very different ways of producing beef or lamb or whatever it or whatever it is. Um, and and I'm not suggesting that we we go back to this way of farming, but so this is milk churns on the left in India and on, on the right in Switzerland. Both these countries have created financial frameworks that recognize that farming achieves far more than just the production of food. So in India, they've got a really inefficient, a scarily inefficient uh, structure because they're wanting to create as many jobs as possible. And if anything, you know, that, that this, this uh, pandemic showed in India was that you know, the, the, the economic and employment situation in India is, is so fragile that they, they can't just do away with all these agricultural jobs out there. So they've got these problems around food safety and, and, and access um, in, into the market for various different villages. Um, but these, these, you know, these milk churns and the network that they've created really allow those rural communities to feed into a huge food network that then feeds cities and provides jobs and income to those others uh, that, that are in need of it. In, in Switzerland on the right, you know, the, the mountains are absolutely covered in small dairies. They create really high value mountain cheese. Each, each valley, I thought this was a bit rubbish, but they swear they can tell the difference between the cheese that comes from a different valley because of the unique blend of herbs and grasses and things like that that go into it. 
when I speak to Swiss people, they really understand that the higher cost of their food allows for a way of farming that focuses far more on environmental harmony than pure productivity alone. Now, you know, I, I said that antibiotic resistance is like a lot of these other sustainable resource issues. If we look at climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen, phosphorus, all of these things, they all follow the same pattern. We have ever increasing local and global impacts. We have an unequal distribution of the consequences and the contribution. We have a tragedy of the commons type question contrasting a small financial gain with this larger global pain. And no matter what the role uh, our role within the industry, we really need to be asking, right, what are my responsibilities? What type of food and farming system do I want to create? I don't like framing these issues around blame, avoidance, denial. We, I think we can act really positively here. Um, drawing these lessons out of, of the antibiotic resistance investigation that I've been doing, I think we really need to focus on, on three areas. Firstly, we need to recognize. So we need to recognize it's taken me a huge amount of time to convince people that antibiotic resistance is, is real and is in need of our, our action. If it takes us this long as an industry to act on things like climate change, I think we're absolutely screwed. So we can really use this as an opportunity uh, to drive change. And one of those key opportunities is data. So we need to be looking at how we can quantify things. So benchmarking, it drives modern day decision making. And I think this needs to be done all the way from the farm level, all the way up to, to internationally. We can drive so much of our decision making with, with data. And then, as I also mentioned, erode these barriers between different levels in our supply chain. And then finally, action. So there, there are really big questions about individual action versus societal level interventions, but we still need to you know, align ourselves with these issues so we're not left behind, take the quick wins that are available to us whilst deciding what happens at, at, a, at a wider stage. Despite the amount of time it's taken us to get this far on the antibiotic issue, I, I remain really positive about our industry um, and are about our ability to lead on, on animal health in general and these other issues of sustainability that are facing us today. Um, that's all I've got to say. I'm really looking forward to getting a bit of uh, a lively discussion going. So um, with that, I'll hand back over to Grace. Thank you so much, Duncan. That was a really interesting presentation. I think we'll agree that's two very good presentations we've uh, been uh, blessed with this evening. Um, so I'm just going to show you um, I screen for one last time. Um, so do get your questions in now. Uh, we're going to get to them in just a minute. Um, before I do, I just wanted to um, share with you our Medicine Hub, which is now live. Um, the Medicine Hub provides a multi-species data hub for dairy, beef and lamb producers uh, to collect their medicine use. Uh, it's something that we're rolling out on HDB and we're promoting and trying to encourage farmers to record their medicine use on and it's something that the um, farmers will be able to share with um, their vets. Um, there's some information here on this slide about Medicine Hub and that should also be um, sent to you. Uh, we also have another webinar on our website um, about specifically using the Medicine Hub so do feel free to check that out. Um, Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen and we can um, have some questions. Um, so, I've um, got all of our speakers here. Um, Grace, if we can, can see you. Wonderful. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, please do get these questions in um, because, you know, we've had a really good discussion. Um, I've got a really good question here for Duncan. Um, so Duncan is talking about some very brave concepts that is saying that efficiency is not always the best thing to aim for. Um, can he share any experience where he has managed to discuss this with farmers and help them aim for profit rather than just efficiency? I think efficiency is a really 
it's a really tricky term um and i don't think it always goes hand in hand with other concepts like like resilience um and i think as we are faced probably less so much on the antibiotic issues but i think definitely with climate change and weather and things like that um where you know i would i would work with farmers where our our forage stock levels would crash so far down because of you know the season that we had the drought followed by flooding or something like that and then you know then we'd be in this position where we have to spend a huge amount to 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 maintain production and this 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 way of farming that we had created so i would be looking at building working capital within those businesses so i always use the benchmark of six pence a liter it's something i got from a guy in america and it it just about works that's the co the, the uh, combination of money in the in the bank uh, up to the end of the overdraft plus forage stocks um combined all the value of that up to six per liter and you know that's going to decrease your profit in year one if, if you if you increase working capital you're not going to use it as as efficiently and you are going to decrease profit but you know when everything hits the fan you're more likely to be resilient and to be able to maintain your um the the the, the reason your reason to be your production uh, in the face of of a big change and that's what resilience is is our ability to flex our ability to maintain ourselves so there are there are solid concepts that aren't always efficiency driven that that do drive this i think you know we haven't got business models that always bang 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 on about you know a, a efficiency we've got some of these other production types out there that's the beauty of the ruminant sector is that we've got millions of different production types all combined into one i think if we were the the american style farming um then it would be very hard to change things but i do think because we've got such a mixture there's lots of different business models and opportunities out there for us to for us to take a different stab at rather than just the full intensive you know, trying to marginal production mm -hmm. side of things thank you very much um so we've got another question might be one for both of you um here um do you feel that issues regarding the environmental benefits and harms caused by livestock farming are adequately taught at vet school uh, if not should they be oh short answer there's many things that are probably not adequately taught very well at vet school but to be fair to vet schools it's because the curriculum is absolutely jam-packed with stuff that you just have to know and so all of these things that actually either really matter immediately most you know most to do with the markets and policy and things that really affect farm businesses are secondary or they're what you pick up along the way and um, but they're massively important to farmers they're huge absolutely huge um but i think yeah there's a definite conversation to be had about i think balancing the um the huge volume of material you've got to learn anyway with stuff that just really matters in life to businesses and i think one of the things that um i'm really passionate about is vets understanding what farm business goals are and right now we're about to undergo one of the biggest agricultural revolutions since day dot in this country we're going to be paid to do things and that's going to shift farming and what farmers do right across the piece and if vets coming out into that environment are not aware of farms being realigned and being changed and thinking about okay if i'm going to get paid to do a whole raft of other things aside or or with the business that I currently have, if they're, if they're not aware of that, then that's difficult to have a meeting of minds so that you get the animal health services aligned to the business goals. So yeah, I think there should be a little bit more of the, um, the bigger policy discussions about what's coming because it's not just airy fairy things, this is actually farm business income and, and it's what's gonna pay the vet bill at the end of the day. So that what your thoughts are, Duncan? Yeah, I think the, I mean, it's, it's basically you leave vet school. And I'm pretty sure I left vet school still knowing absolutely nothing. Um, but what I really saw, especially with like the RVC renewed its curriculum after I went through, and I really saw that they had switched to instilling a way of learning, a and a an ability to synthesize data 
and to process and and to learn and to to find data and and make decisions and i think that they they were absolutely brilliant at that and i think that's one of the greatest skills that as a profession we have going forward because i can say that my learning curve now I mean, it's good because I'm currently doing a master's degree, but my learning curve now is as steep as it has ever been. But, you know, those those first couple of years in practice, you you are learning a huge amount very quickly. Um, yes, we need more just environmental knowledge, just of, of, of fundamental sort of um, concepts behind a lot of it. Um, business skills are massively important. But then I think we can also look at the way we provide mentorship where within practices, um, how do we help vets go from a clinical information into, into a business environment and to provide sound business advice? Because um, so that sort of the continue, the, yeah, the continuum between vet school and the first couple of years in a career is absolutely essential. I think probably senior vets can take a real lead and do take a real lead in, in helping vets on, undergo that transition. Thank you both. Um, I've got another a question for Duncan. Was um, I think it um, refers back to your earlier answer from the question before about resilience. Um, the question asks that they agree that resilience is really important, um, but do you think that it is such a relevant issue in the southwest, where actually, where actually we are blessed with a very fortunate climate? Yeah, I, th I think it's I think it's true. Um, so I'm based I'm based in in Exeter down in down in Devon, um, and we do tend to get a lot of rain. You know, the the dairy a lot of dairy farmers down my way grow a lot of maize, and and you've got to say that when you're stood there in the middle of winter in a cow shed, and there is soil running past you. Um, that I I think probably that's not a resilient business model. That's probably not a sustainable business model, um, and so I think even though we're in a very fortunate part of the country we've got some really good milk contracts around here um and and yeah a lot of grass a lot, lot of um a lot of rain I, I i think we've probably all got um things things to learn about and it, you know it will be grass management as well you know i'm not an agronomist by any by any means but definitely the way in which we're using fertilizer and things like that um are definitely questions that are going to be asked of us over the next few years um, so I think no matter what part of the country, and we've we've got challenges that we face. Wonderful. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, what appetite do you feel UK government has for additional regulation on this issue? For example, designated vet per farm or farm and vet practice abuse benchmarking and use of benchmarking. That's a, it's a really interesting question. So you say appetite. I think the uh, that's that's a hard thing to pin down because right now, from uh, if I was to say what's their appetite for new regulation, their appetite right now is probably for anything new and different um, from what we've done before, and a bit of really up for anything trial and error, try things differently. So I think there might be an appetite. That doesn't mean there's a drive to do it. So I think. The government have seen quite good results if we just look at the antibiotic piece in terms of if you just look at absolute numbers. But that's what we've done um, to reach almost like a plateau level right now. I think the much more difficult thing is to tackle the underlying things that Duncan alluded to. So we've got quite high levels of all sorts of endemic disease in the country that we sit quite happily with and don't challenge quite aggressively. And actually, if you were to begin to tackle and to tap into a lot of those health issues, that's a, it's a hard, tough road, but it, it will drive down your antibiotic use as well and make it much more rationalized and, and, and go this route of much more sort of precision medicine. Um, at what stage would the government step in and regulate? Well, if we look at the veterinary medicine regulations, so the current ones that are in place are the VMRs 2013 that were just made operable when we left the EU. Um, there was meant to be a consultation on them um, last autumn, and that's slipped until this autumn. So this autumn it will open up and you'll have 12 weeks to have your say on the regulations that will entirely cover this whole piece. And they'll probably be on the ground implemented by the following summer, so summer 2022. And within that, you'll see in the consultation paper when the government do release it, what their appetite really is, so how brave they'll be. My feeling is that 
it might reflect a lot of the changes that we've been seeing under development in Europe. So the European regulations that the UK government have actually fed into quite strongly over the last um, 10 years have tightened up on a lot of things. So if you look at prophylactic, routine prophylactic use in terms of veterinary prescriptions, a lot of those top um, headline issues will, I think, come through in this um, piece of legislation. Whether they go further than that and start looking at how you might um, assign a vet practice to a farm and have that contract and that relationship that you see in some countries, I think that's a whole nother step forward. Um, and would potentially tackle um, some of the issues that we have, but I wouldn't be convinced you'd see it in the first round of consultation out this autumn. But I think like everything, it's up for grabs in terms of what we can do. Um, Duncan, you've got an answer to that question as well. And well, very little to add, because I think Grace is probably one of the, the <laughs> most expert people in this field in, in the country, but that one-to-one, that -one, vet farmer relationship i think that benefits every single person in the industry because suddenly you've got accountability and responsibility very clearly defined i know when we were setting up antibiotic benchmarking programs in different parts of the country you know in some areas that just was a massive issue where we had we we, we had this mixing, this this model between different vet, vet practices on an individual farm. And I think, you know, yeah, I think everyone would benefit if we can do that. And I think, I don't know, I, you speak to some vets and they are very like, oh, we can't do that. You know, we, we can't do that in this country. We can, we definitely can. It's all a choice. I think we should choose to just fix this issue. And that would be, that would be right at the top of my list. Lovely. Um, got a general question here. Um, to what extent is farm vet business model profit for meds part of the problem, or is that particular argument a distraction? Duncan, do you want to start on this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, Recognising that I haven't been in primary vet practice for coming up six years now, um, so it's definitely not my field, and I definitely haven't ever owned a veterinary business. I would say that a lot of the people prescribing are not financially rewarded in any way for the amount of drugs that they prescribe. I do think it's a bit of a, a bit of a red herring. Let's be honest, if you were going to design the system from scratch, you would never build in incentives for the use of antibodies into the veterinary uh, financial model. I, I think um, online pharmacies help to shift it somewhat. I don't. You know, one, one vet said it pretty bluntly, if you banned it, all the vets are going to do is just set up a, a sideways business with the same ownership structures and just prescribe it sideways. So like, I think it is probably a red herring. Um, I, I think probably we're better as an industry than to be distracted by that um, and to make that drive our decision making. I, I, think, I think if we're not, we need to be. So yeah, I, we wouldn't design it that way, but I don't really see a benefit uh, uh, of pulling the plug. Okay, Grace, have you got anything else to add? I guess just to add to it, always when you get um, conversations about the costs of antibiotics, we probably don't think about the costs or the incentives involved in other um, other things, such as diagnostics in particular. So there's always the arguments around um, not having enough diagnostics available, you know, the points of care, pen side diagnostics that are affordable enough or that, um, you know, give you your turnaround quick enough. So I think looking at diagnostics and vaccines and antibiotics, it, you have to look at the whole thing in the round. So you have to look at the cost of treatment and look at how do you incentivize vets and farmers to do the right thing? You know, how do you set up the whole system such that it makes sense to run your diagnostic before you prescribe something? Um, or that you prevent the disease in the first place. So it's about looking not just at the cost of one thing, because it's never just about that one thing. It's always a bigger picture. Um, so I think it's worked. It's worked taking a more a stand back from from it and take a bit more of a holistic view. Um, I've got a question for Grace. Um, Grace, how do you think are the best ways to promote sustainability in farming? That's actually a good question for Duncan, considering he's doing a whole master's on, on this. Um, and I, I'm going to start off by saying I am not a sustainability expert. I think we all have a duty to 
to educate ourselves a bit about what sustainability means for the food supply chain, for farmers, for vets. And it, I think hearing different people speak about it, it means very different things to different people. So I think the first thing you have to get to grips with, what does it mean in your, in your, in your world of work? Um, in the world of veterinary medicines, it means something very different. It's all about producing products in a sustainable way and then how we contribute um, to sustainable farming at the end supply, so our input into that. Um, how do you promote it? I think that's a market issue in terms of getting value. Um, a lot of the times I would imagine farmers are going to be driven by if they get a return from the investment on that, so how the whole thing is as Duncan was talking about, separating those good um, producers and the ones that are leading the way, the ones that have that model and perhaps sustainability is is part of that but at the end of the day it's it's where we all have to go we have you have to be sustainable to survive it's about your survival into the future without all of these um negative externalities as, as he's talked about so um it's it's where your funding is going to come from it's what consumers are going to expect so i would say for me personally it's a definitely a journey of education i'll probably be reading duncan's masters as soon as he <laughs> Duncan, have you got any top tips for um, promoting sustainability at all? <laughs> um, taking it as you know, promoting is is a funny it's a funny word, mm. um, but just saying like sustainability, I think has been ripped apart a lot, and it means a lot of different things depending on which you know which sector it's it's coming from. But it is it is a solid scientific discipline. And there are really solid scientific principles that 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 underpin it. And I think a lot of what we get, you know, knee-jerk reactions to questions that are raised are very rarely actually solidly based within sustainability principles. Um, we do have this this issue when it looks when you look at something like um, climate change metrics that intensification tends to decrease per kilo per liter emissions so that's one vision of sustainability versus you know holistic regenerative agriculture that might have lower production per animal but as a more sort of totalitarian uh, not totalitarian but like a, a more encompassing sustainability definition so i think we as an industry probably need to not knee jerk towards one answer or another we need to look at things in the whole we need to also be really willing to make changes you know there's big issues raised with the canadian dairy industry around um palm oil i you know i think it's it's really an opportunity for us as a ruminant sector we we don't really need palm oil within our dairy rations we really don't need soya going anywhere near a cow in the country um we could use these as opportunities to really differentiate ourselves from other areas of uh, agriculture and, you know, other soya-based alternatives. Um, and so, really being being willing to drive change at quite a, you know, an industry level all throughout the supply chain, concerted, um, and and drive it uh, drive it quickly. But you've got to base that in the science to say what's the actual issue, what changes can we make, let's get it done. And that's why I really I was fascinated to go and meet with businesses around the world. You just you just met them and you go, wow, you get stuff done. You see a problem, you figure out what the answer is and you fix it. And I think that is really that inspired me to, to make change and to drive change in businesses because we can. We can, There are loads of low hanging fruit out there in antibodies and the other areas of sustainability that are just still waiting to be picked. Let's go do it. Lovely. Um, we've got some really good questions coming through and I know we're at time, but I'd like to just go through a few more. Um, hopefully um, everyone here can stick with us. Um, but if you do have to go, I just uh, want to um, point you to our feedback form. And if you could just give us some feedback and let us know how we're doing, uh, if there's anything we can improve on or what you liked, then do let us know. But I think we'll just do a couple more questions. Um, we may not be able to do everyone, but we'll do our best. Um, so we've got a question for both of you. Um, how do you think animal genetics will play a role in reducing medicine and antibiotic use um, to also build a good relationship between producer and consumer for sustainable food production? I think that genetics has always been part of a solution. So I think 
when we talk about any of these issues, um, it's a multi-pronged approach. It's not one silver bullet. So it's not one thing that's going to do it. Um, so yeah, no, I absolutely, I, I trained as a veterinary scientist. I wholeheartedly believe in uh, improvement through genetics. Um, and I think it's it's part of the puzzle. It's not the only thing. You could never hope to achieve everything you want to achieve through that. So it's just a piece, a piece of the puzzle. It's really important. And there's a lot of things um, that you can select for. If you just look at things like um, in terms of heritabilities and things where they've improved, um, resilience, just in terms of the health um, scores of animals, there's, there's so much you can do and work on your genetics to improve the situation where you reduce the need to treat animals. You just make more robust animals. It's, it's quite basic at, it's at a simple level um, and you, you prioritize that within your business as important to your resilience and your sustainability going forward so um it's 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 hugely worthwhile and progressive but it, it's not something that you do on its own and duncan i i i think that the genetic database within the uk is one of the best things that comes out of ahdb it's it's absolutely priceless in terms of what it provides to farmers um, and the opportunities for the veterinary industry to lead as experts and to help farmers drive genetic gains is phenomenal. It, the, the, the spread of genetics that we've got in, in every single ruminant sector is scary when you compare it to guys like pigs and poultry. We need to be driving so fast in this area to catch up because the, 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 the stuff and the money that these guys are spending is phenomenal to try and make these animals that are resilient to all these um, all these diseases, uh, productive, healthy, lo long living animals. So, you know, we we really it, it's a great opportunity. I think it also poses quite a threat. I don't. I'm not an expert in it, but the the questions around gene editing and GMOs when we talk about connecting with consumers, I think that's a great way for us to put a lot of scare stories in the media very quickly. I think we'll have to tread very carefully as an industry if we start going down that route and yet still claiming, you know, really sound environmental and sustainability credentials. So I think I think day to day genetics is brilliant. I think we need to just have a conversation and, and, and question where we want to go with it on the next step. Um, another question, um, in terms of actionable measures that vets and farmers can take in the short term to reduce antibiotic use, would you say we should spread our efforts across biosecurity, vaccination, genetic resilience and management improvements, or is there one area in particular that needs to be prioritised in the UK? So if we're talking about at the farm level, every farm's going to be different. So the farm vet themselves will know if, you know, if you're thinking about farm health planning anyway, you'll have an overview of the whole system. Um, and you might have your suspicions that actually there's a couple of problem hot spots. And, and if we really focus in on that, we can make some really good changes. All of the different items that I mentioned will all make improvements. But at the end of the day, you don't want to give somebody a shopping list of actions to go and do. You just reduce the chances of them doing anything. So if there are identified areas, like if biosecurity is dodgy and it is, you've got disease incursions that keep happening on farm um, and you really want to focus in on that, and you think that will make the best improvement, then go for it. If they've just not been engaged with vaccination or getting involved in BVD control programs or looking at IBR, or looking at you know a whole raft of other um, yones maybe as well, a whole raft of other things that would be industry standards and that they really should be involved in, then focus in on that. So I would say make it accessible in terms of the actions in any of those categories, but use the knowledge of the farm as to which you think is more likely to have the biggest impact and have farm engagement on it. So have them come to you with a kind of an agreement that that's manageable for them as well. And you'll more likely get the, um, you know, get it translated and get it done. Um, but all of them are important to drive down antibiotic use. Duncan? Yeah, we've got these, you can always make these sort of graphs of like, how what the impact of making changes is versus how easy it is to make changes all, the, all these sort of things and i think some of those management processes that are straight out of business school 
is really useful in in understanding change management practices. I think it's very we've got to be very aware that some of businesses are going to be going through pretty tough financial times over the next five years as as single payments disappear. So I, I whenever I was I was running farm webinars or or, or sessions uh, in person. I'd always try and not talk about the shiny things because it's so easy to talk about shiny sheds, but actually a lot of the uh, a lot of the things you can do in in very unshiny sheds. So, so, so trying not to focus too much on capital investment. The one the one concept that I quite like talking about is synchronization. So we've got processes that happen at different speeds on farm. You know, we build a shed probably every thirty years. You know, a, a milking parlor every thirty years. Um, genetics is probably a five to ten year program some of these infectious diseases are a, are a single day you can pretty much you know wipe out some of these diseases so i think not only getting the big impactful things but getting the things that you can do very quickly you still have a genetics plan but you understand that it's going to take five years before you really start making big games you still have a building design plan and you're knocking out your yorkshire board in but you understand that right every time I build a shed in the future, I'm going to build it to the latest specifications. But you know, thinking about the processes that are happening in the short term and really picking up, picking up the things that you can in, in them, and not getting despondent that we can't, you know, change, open up a greenfield site all the time. You know, it's, it's it's unrealistic to try and make those expectations. But there's definitely other things that we can look at in the short term. Okay, we've got a couple of questions now. We're getting on, but. Um... Um, one of the problems is that antibiotics are too cheap. The question is, should we put the price of antibiotics up so that for farms it costs more to treat than it does to prevent? I'm just going to say off the top, right off the top, that all antibiotics are POMV medicines at the end of the day. or Every single antibiotic on farm needs a veterinary prescription. So regardless of the cost mechanism behind it. If you look at um, responsible prescribing and what you're supposed to do as a vet, that's your that is the ethics behind it. That's the professional code of conduct um, to prescribe what is required for that animal or that flock or that herd um, for that particular um, you know condition that's there. Um, there's increasingly more work on this in, in the UK. There's an initiative, the Farm Vet Champions, I think, that will begin to chip away at this a little bit, and it's really, really good. Um, I think they'll have all of their modules online, perhaps by the end of this month or next month. And that really looks at how you can get up to speed on what's expected for each of your sectors, and it's particularly good for mixed, mixed vet practices. Um, and then the whole next phase of it, when they um, when that's up and running, will look at how you can set um, different goals, personal goals and practice goals as well. So I think it's it's quite progressive and forward looking in terms of how you look at the whole system differently instead of just looking at it on a cost basis. Because from a vet's point of view, that if that is your your first um, criteria in your decision making, then you are really off on the wrong foot in terms of what you're trying to achieve on that farm. Would you agree, Duncan? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think it's probably good that Grace went first because she filled it with with real stuff from a you know the, within the university systems. A lot of people talk about it a lot, of, and you know it's the same as things like carbon tax and all these antibiotic tax. Yeah, let's do it. If you're going to do something like that. And it's going to remain theoretical because we won't. Um, then you need to offset it by by using the money to supplement other things like your 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 sealants, your your vaccinations, all of your 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 preventative and your your help your your, your helpful uh, medicines because you need to keep the overall cost of the industry the same. Otherwise, our external uh, competition goes down. So. You know these things need to they probably will remain within the theoretical issue um but that's a sort of that's a sort of balance that you would need to strike. We have got this really kind of perverse system that happens with antibiotics as you know we need to reduce their use and guess what the um the cost of them as they come off patent goes down and down and down um so we you know it is it is a little bit messy on that side of things, but it's you know i don't I can't see anything actually changing on that front yeah. Okay, so final question tonight. We've had some really good questions, so we'll end on this one. 
Um, if you have one vet per farm, are you not potentially limiting the scope for new entrants to the industry with new ideas and good competition? I knew this would capture the imagination, the vet per farm thing, and, and it should, but I think it's not um, all or nothing. So in my very simple brain, the way I think about this is like a contract you'd have for any professional service. So I think that you could set up a system where for a period of time, it could be one year, 18 months, two years, depending on the system, what makes sense, that a farm has a contract with that vet, that vet practice, and that within that time frame, you would know that any of the medicines that arrive on that farm have come from that vet practice. It makes it very easy for a red tractor or their insurance schemes um, to be able to have an audit trail as well. But then at the end of that, kind of like getting out of any towards the end of any contract you'd have for a professional service, you can you can decide actually that wasn't uh, what I that that didn't suit my farm business. I don't get on with the practice anymore. I want to change. I, I need someone that offers me different services. And you can move around um, after a period of time, whatever makes sense. So I don't think it's a vet practice for life. I think it's a bit more about understanding that in any given period of time, who has sole responsibility and oversight? What is the contract? Who's the contract between on farm and the prescriber um, to, under to tighten it up a little bit, to understand where those medicines are coming from and what the rationale behind using them was. So I think there's, it's, we can think a little bit more outside the box. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And that allows new entrants, new business models to come in um, and, to, and to compete for offering better services as well. So it doesn't stagnate. It doesn't necessarily have to stagnate the market. In fact, it could shake it up. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think it's, it's as much of an opportunity as it is a threat. I think, you know, there's always a call for good farm vets um, and I don't think that's going to change by making it one vet, one one farmer. Um, I, I I don't think you know you could change it five times a week for all I care. I just want to know exactly on every single day who was the vet in charge of this farm, who was the nutritionist in charge of this farm as well. You know, like who do I go to to to, to speak to about this? I, I think it's a it's a real positive. I do th you know great opportunities for new entrants all all, the, all across the country um, for farm vets because that you know it's a business model that's constantly evolving and that always brings in opportunity. So now I don't think it's a threat and or, or, or a threat of stagnation. Um, and and yeah, I think it can be as flexible as we like, but I think it can happen. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Duncan, and thank you, Grace, uh, for two fantastic presentations and for answering those questions. Um, thank you to all our participants um, who have sent in our questions and stuck with us, even though we've overrun, uh, which is this, a great um, proportion of our attendants are still with us. So it must have been a good discussion. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, and thank you, everybody, again. Um, please do leave us some feedback and um, check out um, all the information we have online as well at AHDB, including the Medicine Hub. Take care. Thanks everyone, take care.